Well, hello again, everyone. Welcome back. We are coming down the home stretch of what has been a remarkable day. For those of you who have been with us since the beginning, we admire your devotion and resilience. Thanks for spending time with us. This is the sixth session of today's Media and Us Symposium Workshop. The name of this session is titled News Literacy and Journalism. It will feature Mickey Huff, Andy Lee Roth, and Raina Robinson. So uh, before we begin, as always, I want to acknowledge we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. I'd like to take this moment to honor those who have come before us as stewards of the land with an offering of respect. So a word about our participants for this last session. Mickey Huff is, of course, the director of Project Censored and president of the Media Freedom Foundation, author of numerous books, Raina Robinson is the coordinator for services of San Francisco Bay Area Justice Involved Youth since 2016. She's an educator, a certified community resilience model, and youth mental health first aid instructor amongst serving the community in many different ways. Uh, Andy Lee Roth is the associate director of Project Censored and co-editor of 13 editions of the project's yearbook. Uh, we've posted more extensive bios for all our authors on the City Lights website. We're including links for those, as well as links on how to buy Media and Me, the book which this symposium has been influenced by and based upon. Uh, all of today's sessions are intended to be interactive, so we encourage you all, please do communicate with us and each other via the chat function of your Zoom dashboard. Also want to remind everyone, today's sessions will be posted on YouTube, so if you miss anything, you'll be able to go back and view it at your leisure. I'm happy to share titles of books that have been mentioned during this symposium. I've been keeping a list. Also happy to share the chat, fu uh, chat function uh, comments and questions as well, so just uh, email me at peter at citylights.com. Uh, so please join us now in welcoming our session leaders, Mickey Huff. Andy Lee Roth and Raina, welcome to session six of Media and Us. Thank you so much, Peter. And once again, a heartfelt thanks to City Lights. It's just an honor to be working together with City Lights. And um, earlier today, I think we linked and, and mentioned, and you mentioned on the website, um, it's, uh, it's in addition to the now 14 annual Project Censored books I've done, uh, almost all of them with Andy, Andy Lee Roth, um, Nolan Higdon and I did United States of Distraction, fighting, um, um, media manipulation and post-truth America and what we can do about it with City Lights in 2019. And it was an honor to, to be able to publish with City Lights. Uh, now we've started the Censored Press and um, the Project Censored continues to publish our annual book and the one we're here today talking about, which is The Media and Me. And uh, our one-time editor and uh, now board member, uh, Veronica Liu from the Word Up community actually um, gave us some re a really nice comment. Andy reminded me about our book, Media and Me. Veronica said, Project Censored's decade-long efforts to promote critical media literacy are finally extending to even younger audiences needed now more than ever. And that's really what we're doing here today. You know, it's really what we're talking about. And the Media and Me um, is our new book. It'll be out in late December, but you can get a copy now at City Lights or through us at projectcensored.org. Um, this um, this is going to be an interesting session, and we welcome, of course, Andy Lee Roth and Raina Robinson. Raina, thanks so much for, for coming in. Nolan Higdon is traveling, and I don't believe we'll be able to make it uh, with us here today, but we're really delighted to have Raina join us. And of course, we're delighted to have all of you here with us. So with that, Chapter 7 in the Media and Me is called News and Journalism. Project Censored is a news literacy organization, and as you see from the authors of the book, um, we, you know, kind of riffing, we were joking with our, our publishing partner, Dan Simon, and we were riffing around when we were writing this book, and we were kind of sort of like, well, it's just kind of like Prince and Prince the Revolution, and so we were kind of riffing on that title, Purple Guitars and All, Project Censored and the Media Revolution Collective, and Project Censored is uh, has been around since 1976, and we, we, we've been, uh, I mean, I have not been with the project since then, I was five. Uh, <laughs> nor Andy, but Carl Jensen founded the project at Sonoma State University um, back in 1976 and directed for 20 years when our good friend uh, and colleague, uh, sociologist Dr. Peter Phillips took over the project. 
Uh, Peter was working with us until he retired a few years ago. I became director in 2010 and Andy Roth um, came back and joined and Andy and I have been, been working ever since together. We have a huge affiliates program, campus affiliates program. We've really grown the project in a lot of ways, radio, film, et cetera. And this is the next iteration, Project Censored in the Media Revolution Collective, that put together this book that we're talking about all day today, The Media and Me. So um, Project Censored, I'm going to do a little bit of a history and talk about the role of the free press, uh, journalistic ethics, what we do, and how it relates to the media and me. And then Andy's going to pick up on a number of points that go on with the project, and Raina is going to chime in with us as well. And as always, um, we want to hear from you in the chat, and we certainly want to incorporate your thoughts and ideas and feedback. Carl Jensen founded Project Censored at a time when critical media literacy wasn't a thing. It wasn't even a phrase or a buzzword or jargon. Um, but what he was doing was critical media literacy through news, uh, teaching people about the news. Carl was writing in 1976 about the sort of the fallout of the 1972 election and then the uh, Watergate. And even though Nixon resigned by 1974, um, you know, and Carl saw himself as a pretty news savvy person, but he looked back and wondered that why had it taken um, Woodward and Bernstein's story in the Washington Post to break, to sort of break this story and um, that led in part to the fall of, of the Nixon presidency. But, but Jensen went back and looked and found that there were other news organizations, independent outlets and things that were writing about the corruption of the Nixon administration, writing about uh, these things that, th that then at the time, what we'd call the establishment or legacy press, the main newspapers, the network news. Remember, this is before cable. This is before the internet. Um, they, they hadn't caught on until a little later. And so J Jensen literally founded Project Censored on the idea that even the best intentioned, intrepid journalists, uh, people like uh, Woodward or Bernstein, uh, I'll reserve my other commentary about those folks for maybe later. Um, but nevertheless, Jensen, um, he said, well, it's curious that there were other people writing about these things and they just weren't getting the time of day. So Jensen said, I wonder what else is it really getting covered by the legacy or establishment press? Or I wonder how long of a lag time there is. And I know Andy might talk about that a little later between the time that the independent press covers a story and the legacy establishment, so-called mainstream corporate media actually pick these stories up. And this is a big part of, of the history of Project Censored. Well, what Jensen also noted at the time was that Walter Cronkite, who later became to be a, a fan of the project, um, he was actually trying to write about and, and do stories about Watergate at the time. And the Nixon White House itself literally contacted CBS News, the president of CBS News, and told him not to cover the story. So there's a real story about government intervention and censorship at the root of the beginning of what Project Censored is and does. Carl turned this into a news literacy project, and here we are now. Um, we're coming up on our 50th anniversary, believe it or not. We're the longest-running media watchdog project in the country. And so why not extend that to younger people? Why not just, not, not just in college classrooms, but why not try to extend news literacy education into the, into the high, junior highs into high schools. And that's what we're trying to do with media and me. So what is the role of the free press? I mean, we start with this, this question. And, and nowadays, you know, the public in the United States is a very poor um, opinion of the establishment press, uh, so-called mainstream media. Um, it has record high, low approval ratings, some probably earned in some part. But it's also the case that half the public is getting their news and information from social media, which aren't journalistic outlets, which is a huge problem that we can probably tackle and get into later. But the role of the press is important, right? Um, the free press um, sets agendas. They, they're allegedly watchdogs, the fourth estate. They're allegedly watchdogs for those in power. Um, they disseminate necessary information and mobilize the public in ways so that we can participate, be civically engaged in a more meaningful way. So the journalism is, is the life's blood of our, of our republic. And one of um, our long running judges, Nicholas Johnson, who was in the FCC uh, in the 60s and 70s, actually wrote a book called Your Second Priority that says that no matter what your primary area of interest or activism is, if your second isn't media democracy or uh, press freedoms, you're likely to gain very little ground in your primary area of interest. And that's really uh, animated and, and driven a lot of what we do at Project Censored. And as I mentioned in an earlier session today, Andy Lee Roth and I like to look at the, the uh, look at 
media criticism, not just from the critical negative, but the affirmative. We, we look at, well, what's going wrong or awry in the corporate media and how, do independent, how does an independent press uh, fulfill the role of the fourth estate in many cases? And we'll certainly be getting to um, to the the chat. Yeah, I hear you, Mara. I hear what you're saying about that's backwards. It should be the number one. Well, at Project Censored, it is the number one priority. So I guess it's number one and two for us, uh, the issue of the free press. But I wanted to get into what, what some of the core, um, uh, really the core philosophy and the ethics behind a free press. And we subscribe to the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. Um, you can learn those at spj.org. We believe that journalism should seek, sh journalists should seek truth and report it. We believe that they should minimize harm. We believe that uh, journalists should act independently and be accountable and transparent. Well, we write about that in Media and Me, and we think that it is a, the right time to start teaching people is when they're young about what an ethical press looks like and what ethical journalism looks like. And of course, the other things that have long uh, influenced our, our work at Project Censored is uh, Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky's propaganda model. And we, one of the last things Edward Herman wrote before he passed at the age of 92 was he wrote a chapter for Censored 2018, the propaganda model at 30, the 30th anniversary of the propaganda model that looks at ownership, advertising, sourcing, elite sourcing, uh, flack or boycotts and feedback and ideology as five filters that shape the way news kind of happens and is disseminated in the public. And at Project Censored, we're very mindful of that. And we've even updated it for the digital era about algorithmic censorship, digital gatekeeping, and so on. So um, I'm going to hand things over here to uh, Andy Lee Roth, because Andy has a lot of other things that he's going to add to this. And, um, and then Raina Robinson's going to come in. Uh, we're going to have a lot more to say about censorship by proxy, what it looks like now, and why we really need news media literacy maybe more than ever as our eco uh, media ecosystems gets more complicated mm -hmm. and controlled by big tech as well as we still have the legacy and establishment press. I think it's really important that, um, that everybody thinks that this is something we should be understanding and discussing. So I'll certainly have more to say, but I, I want to turn things over to my good friend and colleague, Andy Lee Roth. Andy? Thanks so much, Mickey. And we'll do, I think each of us will do a quick go around and then we'll cycle probably through again. Um, so uh, just picking up on what Mickey said, um, I, you know, a few years ago, we decided to state in the beginning of the censored yearbook, what our guiding principles as an organization are, and they were pretty simple to articulate. Um, they really boil down to three basic uh, commitments. One, that we champion independent investigative journalism. The emphasis there is on independent as opposed to corporate. That's, if you will, the affirmative dimension of the project, the hope for the future element that we were talking about earlier today. Um, the second guiding principle is that we hold the corporate news media to account when they fail to provide the public the kind of information that we need, the kind of news and information that we need to be engaged community members and active citizens. So that's the critical dimension of the project. And then uh, to me, the third element is what makes Project Censored even today, um, when there are many more media watchdog organizations than there were when Carl founded Project Censored back in 1976, what makes the project continuously significant and distinctive today is that we provide hands-on training and critical media literacy uh, uh, work to students, to college and university students across the country through our campus affiliates program. And we make our students, we make those students work public. And uh, in some ways, this, this point that I want to make uh, about that straddles um, some of what we were talking about earlier in the day about how to engage students. It's very important, I think, when students are researching uh, candidate stories for our annual list of the 25 most important but underreported stories, students quickly recognize that the work they're doing is not only an assignment for a class that they're taking to perhaps get credits to graduate um, and so forth and so on, but that the work they're doing has relevance outside of the four walls of the classroom. It potentially has an audience beyond the four walls of the classroom and the instructor of the course. Um, we publish 
uh, what we call validated independent news story summaries on the project's website. Each year we look at, uh, we meaning the students and their uh, faculty advisors, um, we look at several hundred uh, uh, stories that we're evaluating for their credibility, their importance, their adherence uh, to the standards, uh, the SPA, SPJ ethics that Mickey mentioned earlier. Um, and from those each year, uh, we have a distinguished panel of international judges. Uh, Mickey mentioned one of them, Nicholas Johnson, former FCC commissioner, a panel of 28 or so judges who help us then identify and rank order a, a story list every year of the 25 most important but underreported stories, all sourced from independent news outlets and all originally um, researched and vetted by uh, college and university students participating in the campus affiliates program. So, um, and that process has been going on, as Mickey mentioned, long before either he or I were involved. I became involved in this out of an interest in the news that developed in my study of sociology, very much inspired by uh, the work of the late Ben Bagdikian, whose book Media Monopoly is kind of a touchstone for anyone interested in um, the news and the political importance of news media. Bagdikian would tell anyone on any occasion who he could get to listen that media power was political power, right? And that idea, I think, informs a lot of uh, the kind of critical media literacy perspective in, in this book when it comes to news and journalism, that we're thinking about it in terms of how the social forces that shape the production of news and what the social consequences of those production processes are. Now, that sounds fancy, uh, uh, like I'm slipping into some sociological jargon. But really, uh, what we're talking about, and I think what we'll dig into some more before the hour is up here, is how professional news values help to define who and what count as newsworthy, um, which from a critical perspective, we would note that often the corporate news media have fairly narrow definitions of who and what count as newsworthy, whereas independent quote, alternative media often have more inclusive definitions of who and what count as newsworthy. We're also interested in trying to, uh, to tease out what are the consequences of how news organizations are organized and what the day-to-day -day routines of reporters and editors and other news professionals are and how those shape what we eventually come to see as the news of the day. Um, these are all issues that are infused with that Bagdikian conception of, of media power being political power. Um, one more point, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Raina to talk some more about media, the power of kind of news frames and framing. Um, one basic point that I think is super important is made by another of uh, the project's judges, uh, Bob Hackett, who founded Newswatch Canada uh, decades ago. And one of, uh, one of Hackett's great observations is that news in its corporate form tends to be about what went wrong today and not often about what goes wrong every day. In other words, because of news values that define who and what are important in narrow ways and news collecting routines that privilege novelty, systemic social problems are often underreported in the corporate news media. And if you look at any of the annual story lists of the project's top 25 important but underreported stories, what you'll see is that we're consistently tracking what in sociological terms would be considered public issues. They are large scale societal issues that often deal with systemic inequalities or power uh, imbalances and the consequences of those. So a concrete example, uh, tragic as, say, the uh, shootings at Sandy Hook and Uvalde are, um, those often receive considerable uh, saturation news coverage from the corporate news media. But if you look to try to understand the everyday consequences of gun violence in the United States, you'll find little to nothing. You'll find episodic reports localized here, there, 
but very little reporting that covers the 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 absolutely um, sickening scale of gun violence in the United States. And that fits with Hackett's notion that news is about what went wrong today versus what goes wrong every day. Um, and I think that's one form of, uh, of, in effect, slant in corporate news coverage that seldom gets talked about because most people, most of the time, when we talk about bias in news reporting, we're talking about liberal versus conservative biases, red versus blue, Democrats versus Republicans. Um, but from my perspective as a sociologist who studies news, um, a much more fundamental bias is journalists' reliance on official bureaucratic sources, whether those officials are corporate spokespeople or whether they're government officials, elected politicians, et cetera. Corporate news tends to focus on those people as the people who are news makers and the most authoritative commentators on the news. And that provides a very narrow window, a narrow window through which to understand what's important in our society, in our communities and, and so forth. I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, Raina, do you wanna jump in and add? add some more. Sure, thank you, Andy. Um, so I, uh, I'm gonna to touch on our um, pack a little bit um, um, about uh, news framing uh, through the, um, as it relates to um, African-Americans or, or young um, people of color um, and how the media, you know, kind of packages and presents uh, information about um, young people of color. Um, and, use, and uses the news as a tool to continue to oppress uh, youth of color. Um, and, and the more concrete uh, example I would like to use is uh, that of the Central Park Five. Uh, if you are not familiar with uh, the Central Park Five, um, it, um, it, it, it was a, a story in um, New York City in I believe it uh, 19, um, was it 1989? Let me make sure. Yes, in 1989. Um, and there was a very brutal uh, rape and beating of a jogger. Um, and uh, there is a film called uh, When They See Us uh, that, um, that uh, tells the story. Um, but the connection to uh, news media literacy is, um, is that of Trump. So a, a much younger Trump um, at the time that this story um, was taking place, uh, Trump actually took out um, $85,000 worth of advertisement in local New York City um, um, papers um, with the headline, bring back the death penalty, bring back our, um, our police. Um, and more specifically calling for the death penalty of uh, these five uh, black and brown young men um, who I, I will allow you guys to do research if you would like, but who most of them uh, proclaimed their innocence. Um, and they also had intersections of uh, special education, uh, autism, um, uh, things of that nature that affected their, uh, their cognitive and uh, ability and um, many different neurodiversities, uh, which um, weren't taken into consideration when they were um, being wrongly convicted. Um, so when we talk about the, the newspaper advertisements that uh, Trump uh, took out, he explicitly um, attacked these young men. And at the time, these were, uh, th these were teenagers. Um, they were not yet adults. Um, so when we, so that was probably one of the, uh, the most uh, heinous that I can remember uh, um, senses of um, news neglect, um, I would say. Um, and we continue to see um, stories similar to this uh, happen um, nationally. Um, and they, some young people might not be as, um, as lucky, unfortunately, as these men to be have, have been exonerated maybe 30 years uh, later. So they still have a, a shot left at life. Um, but I just really wanted to um, call out that example as a, as a tangible example of how um, crucial news media literacy is today. 
Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, we could, we could unfortunately go over more and more examples, so many examples of that. And I just reminded me, Raina, in the first Project Censored documentary film from 1998, Ernest Smith at San Francisco State University, Journal is a professor there, uh, talked about that framing and the way that media cover issues, particularly um, regarding people of color, was the Rodney King beatings and how Reginald Denny, the white trucker, was framed and treated in the media versus King. Um, I mean, again, we could go on and on, unfortunately, with so many of these examples, but news framing is is really important. And I think that slant, um, spin, you know, that that's how we framing works to do that. And, and it makes it makes an issue look a certain way. Um, that is, of course, a message that's being crafted by owners of the press, right? This is not accidental. And it's designed to give a certain impression to a particular audience to generate a particular outcome. What's the outcome? Public support for X, right? Um, so these things are directly connected. And, and going back to the beginning of the project, that's, that's how Carl founded it. He literally was doing his own real-time experiment around Watergate and what he did and didn't know and what the role of the media was. And he turned it into a class. And uh, literally the class is now what we call the validated independent news stories. And Andy Roth and Steve Masick run uh, the Campus Affiliates Program, and they oversee the validated independent news stories that come in that get onto our ballot. They go through multiple stages of vetting. Um, and I think that it's a really useful assignment for people, and uh, especially for younger people, because it introduces them to all of these concepts that we're talking about while they're actually doing something. They're actually interfacing with news media. You know, they're actively looking and researching into stories that they may have an interest in that are about their communities and things that are happening. And, and when they start to realize and see that their stories aren't in the corporate press or in the so-called mainstream, we don't use that term at Project Censored. There's nothing mainstream about six corporations and five big tech companies that control a majority of what you hear, read, and see. We talk about corporate media, legacy media, establishment media. We try to use more descriptive terms that really showcase what that what's happening there with that kind of propaganda, right? Or as Peter Phillips would call it, top-down managed news, which is what it is in many ways. And so, um, you know, further into this chapter, we, we in, in the media and me, we pull from other areas. We go back to chapter two on critical thinking and we're like, well, hey, remember those biases? Remember how confirmation bias works? How about inferred justification, which is the way in which we Motivated reasoning. We, when we see something happening and we, we have a hard time, it's square peg, round hole, we see a certain thing happening that, that, that challenges our own belief system, creates cognitive dissonance. One of the classic examples of this was the invasion of Iraq in 2003, um, right? When, when we were being led to war on the basis of falsehoods. And after the war began in 2004, um, a lot of people were collectively scratching their heads saying, where are the weapons of mass destruction or ma more like weapons of mass deception? Um, where are they? Why aren't they there? Well, so many people had a hard time wrapping their head around the fact, well, did they lie? Did the government lie? Did the media get it wrong? Um, that they use what's called motivated reasoning. There must be a reason that this happened. There must be a reason they got it wrong. Um, so it's built in. There's a bias that's already built into the way people are receiving the news and information, which makes it easier to be manipulated. And being critically media literate and understanding how media operate gives people the opportunity to be in the driver's seat, so to speak. It means that they're kind of in control of their own mind. Now, when the moral panic of fake news hit after the 2016 election, causing the, the, uh, the Oxford Dictionary folks to coin post-truth as the hyphenated word of the year, and we write about that in the media and me, um, we said at Project Censored, Andy and I said, there's no post-truth. That's just confirmation bias propaganda. That's just believing what one wants to believe on the basis of feelings and, and emotions and opinions, not actual evidence, right? And so what we hammer at at this chapter is that it's so important to understand empirical evidence. It's so important to be able to understand the, the importance of independent media. Don't conflate independent with objective. We're not saying that any media is actually technically objective. What we're saying is that independent news media outlets are independent from corporate funding and advertiser funding. They don't rely on the same official elite sources. And if they do have an ideological bias, which they all do, they tend to wear it on their sleeve. They tend to tell you what you're getting, so you know what you're getting. When you go to Yes Magazine and social justice reporting there, you know what you're getting. And Andy has, has published there, and his work has been featured there. 
over the years. When, when you go to other independent outlets, you generally know what you're getting. The New York Times pretends that it's all the news that's fit to print or what we say, all the news that fits the print, <laughs> meaning they've already got an idea of what the narrative and the story is and they're going to funnel it in. And anything that doesn't fit into their myopic view falls out of favor. It doesn't get into the news. And when students really start to see that literally, that's what we mean by censorship. Censorship in this case is not the same thing as government censorship, where the First Amendment protects uh, media outlets or the press against government intervention. By the way, we know it doesn't. I started this conversation with the prime example of how concrete, I'm sorry, how Walter Cronkite was censored in that regard by government. And there's many others. We know Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, right? These are real issues. Um, we do know that happens. But the more pernicious, I think, or insidious form of censorship is more censorship by proxy. And it's more of a censorship, a corporate censorship, right? Earlier this year with the Russian invasion, the illegal Russian invasion of Ukraine, it wasn't the government that censored RT America. It was Roku, DirecTV, and the cable companies that got rid of it and got rid of Lee Camp's show, Redacted Tonight, Pulitzer Prize winner Chris Hedges' show on Contact, Abby Martin's 550 Breaking the Set shows disappeared, disappeared off YouTube, right? Censorship is, is not just something that happens in government and at Project Censored, we have long argued that censorship by proxy, big tech, algorithms, that's what's the name of the game today. And we need to be more mindful about how that works. And we do. And in our new book, Andy and I uh, wrote in the, out, in the outset, the uh, state of the free billionaire press and the word free is crossed out <laughs> because there's nothing free ab about it, right? And it's not just Musk uh, at Twitter. It's Bezos and the Washington Post and Andy. Um, we had a great listing of these things about a lot of um, a lot of these billionaire pe uh, a people and, and uh, organizations uh, or hedge funds that own a lot of the press that we don't really think about, right? And and so again, we list them. We list a number of them. And this is also, by the way, not something that's new. The corporate ownership, the elite financial ownership of the media. Upton Sinclair was writing about it a hundred years ago in the Brass Check. A.J. Liebling warned about it in his column in The New Yorker in the Wayward Press in 1961 when he talked about freedom of the press belongs only to those who own one. So these aren't even new concepts. Ben Bedicki and Canary in the Coal Mine that Andy mentioned earlier, right, in 1982, Media Monopoly, said, hey, there's only 50 companies left owning the media, and now we're down to six. So these are real tangible things. We've had warnings. We've had signposts. This is not conspiracy theory. And interesting, Carl Jensen said that in the beginning when he founded the project, some of the critics said, like, this sounds like a conspiracy theory. He's like, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's a business model. <laughs> and it serves the ideology of those in, in the business class because it's run as a business. A free press should operate, in our view, in the interest of we the people. And it should come from the bottom up, not the top down. And that's kind of the, the, what we try to instill in, in young people in the media and me to try to get them. We're not trying to get them to understand it. They already understand it. All you need to do is show them the examples and then they'll start showing you examples. They'll start saying, hey, look at how TikTok works. Look at what is and isn't on Twitter. And they'll start to, they'll start to tell us the things that we need to pay attention to. So I'm going to stop rambling here. I want to make sure we get to other folks, including Andy um, and, and Raina. Uh, in this regard. Andy, Arena, is there something else that you want to add to this as we go through the chat? Well, yeah, I, I can say more, but I also would welcome questions and uh, we would welcome, I should say, questions, comments, observations from, from all the participants on, on, on the session right now. Um, yeah. Raina, do you want to add anything? I can always jump in with more, but I don't want to uh, take space from other people. Go ahead. You're good. I think one of the things I would say that the book, does, The Media and Me, does is it uh, we address something that many of us have encountered as educators when we talk about news. And a lot of my students would say, we talk about this at a point in the semester where we often knew each other well enough that people would be like candidly honest. And they'd say, Professor Roth, Andy, I don't listen to the news. I don't pay attention to the news. And I would say, why not? And they'd say, it's too discouraging. It's too depressing. And so another element of the news and journalism chapter in the media and me addresses that concern. A lot of news, especially in its corporate form, is designed to 
captivate us through fear, a theme we talked about earlier. Um, but there are there's an entirely different kind of brand, if you will, of journalism. It's not a corporate brand. It's an approach um, that is known as solutions journalism. And Mickey mentioned Yes Magazine earlier, which here in the US has been a pioneer of solutions journalism. Um, there is the solution journalism news tracker, um, an online resource. And when students would tell me that the news is too depressing, I would say maybe you need to add more solutions journalism to your news diet. Um, solutions journalism, just to unpack that term uh, very quickly, is not kind of good news stories like feature in the last three minutes of the evening news broadcast on the networks where the cat was stuck in the tree and the firefighters came and rescued it. Solutions journalism focuses on um, solutions to enduring systemic problems that have been successfully addressed often at the community level by grassroots organization, or more generally, people coming together to address problems that they see as social rather than individual, right? And here I'm thinking of the great sociologist C. Wright Mills, who talked about how there will never be individual solutions to collective problems. So solutions journalism highlights, uh, without necessarily committing you to a sociological viewpoint, highlights communities and people coming together to create solutions to long-term problems. These are stories that it makes sense for the corporate news media not necessarily to promote because oftentimes the problems are created by corporate entities. We were talking earlier, for instance, today about Monsanto and Bayer. Um, we could also talk, as Project Center has covered for some time, um, uh, fossil the fossil fuel industry and fracking in communities. If you read corporate news, you might occasionally get an XL Keystone XL pipeline type of story that has legs for some time, but you won't hear about smaller community-based efforts to get a particular fracking well shut down or how there are actually networks of activists across the country sharing information. Those stories you'll find reported in places like Yes Magazine and other solutions journalism outlets. But Right. It you kind of like I would ask my students, why might a big corporate outlet that takes advertising money from BP or name the fossil fuel uh, corporation? Why might why might they not be running those kind of stories about those kind of community organizations? So solutions journalism, I think, for anyone, not just students, for anyone who finds news to be disheartening, discouraging, um, uh, you know, there are meaningful alternatives that are not fluff pieces, but real like journalism that lives up to the highest SPJ eth ethics, but has a wider definition of who and what count as newsworthy. Reina or anyone, anyone else um, want to chime in here? Again, you can see that we could sort of go on and on and on. I had to stop myself before I realized how many minutes were going by. Um, you know, one of the things that our founder, Carl Jensen, wrote a number of years ago um, was that we do have a, a powerful system of information dissemination, and we do have the framework for protecting uh, a truly free press. Um, but he said it was really up to us to maintain it, and that he advocated strongly that education, education, educators, high schools, colleges, universities, journalism programs promote more muckrakers and fewer buckrakers. <laughs> that was one of the lines that he used over and over again, was that journalism schools should, should be pointing out that people need to go and, and hold power accountable, tell the stories that help people in the community understand what's happening so that they can participate more meaningfully in society um, and not be chasing the dollar signs. Commercial corporate media is about the dollar signs. Social media is about data harvesting, surveillance, and dollar signs. Notice how that those aren't the principles of, of uh, ethical journalism. And at Project Censored, that's what we try to uphold, and that's what we try to honor every year. And um, again, I'm just, again, uh, honored and privileged to work with so many wonderful people through the project, and now including our collective that put together 10 authors and artists that put together the media and me. City Lights has 
uh, those books available now before the book is even out. We also have them at our website if you're interested in getting the Media and Me and our media uh, study guide that goes with it. And also this book comes out Tuesday, December 6th. It is State of the Free Press 2023 with a great forward by Heidi Bogosian. Um, and Andy and I are very excited to see that fly off the shelves. And uh, anybody here that's interested or anybody later watching that wants to um, hear from us or have us do workshops or speak to classrooms or help provide resources, we also next year are going to be embarking upon a program that helps give these books and resources to schools and libraries across the country. Please feel free to get a hold of us, and we, we'd love to hear from you. And we, we'd love to continue to grow our network and continue to grow the message in the media and me and extend it to as many young people as possible.